Hey, if you're loving Creative Mind, check out some of our past episodes where we dive deep into topics like children's book illustration, video game design, filmmaking, and of course, the most important topic of all, how do you make a living as an artist? So please hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on so you never miss an episode. And check out the show notes for links to our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube page for even more great content. I help you, you help me, like everyone's gonna win. So I think that's something that happens when you're in art school, you kind of, you gain a little bit of that mentality and that mentality really helps you in the art community because you never stop working together. Like you're always on a team, you know, that's what filmmaking is and, and animation is. Everyone's working together towards the, t the common goal. That was Emmy award-winning producer, director, writer, and just all around fun guy, John Harvatine. Hi, I'm Bobby Brill, and on this episode of Creative Mind, we talk stop motion, creativity, and really what a path in the world of being a working artist looks like in our conversation with John Harvatine. Harv is one of the driving forces behind the illustrious Stupid Buddy Studios. Known for shows like Robot Chicken, Harv's very personal show, Crossing Swords, and the newly released Marvel's Modoc. Joining us on this podcast is also Aaron Guadamuz, a stop motion artist and stop mo lead here at the Academy of Art as well. But before we get into it, please hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. And now here's our conversation with John Arvatine. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you because this was, you know, kind of one of the early wish lists when we started the podcast, because I think everybody who goes through art school or has ever picked up a camera or is a video nerd wants to do stop motion or attempts it. And it seems that it's the most accessible way to be, you know, filmmaker with a capital F. What was the 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 reason for you to jump in and become a stop motion artist or a stop motion film director? Right, right. Well, I think you know, kind of what you're saying there. You know, like when I started out, um, and the same thing with kids today. I have kids, so I can see, I can relate. Um, it's very accessible. You know, you get a camera and you're able to instantly grab anything around you and you can start telling stories with your toys or with puppets or whatever you have in front of you, as opposed to that old school technique of learning how to draw and getting good <laughs> at that, or the computer, which I still don't quite understand. I mean, I understand computers, but like CG animation, you know, like that's that seems pretty challenging. And maybe for kids, it's also like a, a, a bigger step. But again, for me, it was just, I wanted to tell stories. These were tools I had in front of me, a video camera and action figures. And it was, you know, a way I can quickly do that. What was the first format you shot in? Like, what, what, what was it video or was it film or was it? Yeah, was it? I wish it was film. I really do. It was VHS. So VHS. Yeah. So for me, we had uh, an old VHS where you had a VHS camcorder and you'd hold down the button for as quick as possible, but it'd be like a second or two. So that was like fifth grade and sixth grade. I started doing stop motion stuff. Well, I wanted to be a Disney cartoonist, but I, my skills weren't there. So I, I had that animation itch early on, but I just couldn't draw that well. But then I was thinking like filmmaking is what I want to be like a Steven Spielberg, like make E.T. or, you know, I guess back then Star Wars, that's not Lucas or that's that's not Spielberg, it's Lucas. But I wanted to be a, a filmmaker. Um, but again, I didn't. I, you know, I had, I had friends and stuff like that, but I had more action figures, more of those kind of things. So I felt like I could tell stories better with the things I had around me. Um, and I, I just never lost that interest. So as I pursued my career and I went, went to school and to college, thinking I could get a job doing live action filmmaking things. But in the back of my mind, I had stop motion as a thing that was kind of a hobby as something that perhaps I could do. So I kind of kept that as a back burner thing. I enjoyed doing it. It was something I, I just kept doing. But I never thought I could have a job doing it. I never, until I actually got a job, did I think this can be a living. This is something that I could do. So, so what was that first job then? When did you realize early on? Or what was that, that job that you went, this is actually going to pan out? Yeah. Well, even, that's even kind of funny. Because my first job in stop motion was right when I got out of school. And it was at a small stop motion studio called Reckless Abandon Studios in Connecticut. And they were doing commercials and kind of smaller work. Um, but when I went out there, that's when I first learned what it's like to be a freelance artist because you kind of hear about it in school, but until you're actually like boots on the ground, freelance artist, like check to check, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. Like this, this is how it works. Like you work a gig and then oftentimes you're back on the street looking for work. 
So even though I, I started right away out of school as an animator, I mean, I, after six months, I was laid off and I was looking for the next job. Luckily, they, they kept hiring me and I was able to keep getting work for them for a couple of years. But right away, I started thinking, oh, wait, like, this isn't a guarantee to have like stop motion career or like work forever. Like you got to keep hustling and keep looking and you never stop looking. So that, I wish I would have learned that in school because that was kind of a wake up call. And so then early in my career, I was definitely thinking, well, this is fun, but you know, the wheels might fall off the bus at any moment. So what's my backup? What else can I do to keep making money in case this runs out? And then 9-11 hit and then animation really kind of got quiet. So then I like hustled and did some still photography stuff. Um, but luckily the stop motion scene came back after that and it's been slowly growing and it's it's really, really active. I was actually today. gonna, that was something I actually wanted to bring up is that uh, even to this day, you know, a lot of the people I know that work on stuff in stop motion, they're somewhat nomadic, you know, like they they go, it's kind of one of these things where when that's the, the main thing people do, a lot of times they'll, they, they where are they, they kind of, They'll be like off in London working for a while or up in yeah. Port Portland for a minute or, you know, down in L.A. a lot. And it kind of depends on what's going on, you know. Yeah. So and that's even to this day. I mean, I, I definitely feel you on the freelance art thing because, you know, that's that. I think everyone yeah, that's has gone through that a little bit, you know, or a lot, yeah. you know. So to me, what it means is, you know, the people who do it are, you know, truly believe in it. They're very passionate about it. You know, that yeah. our students, you know, the stop most students, they're they're really passionate about it. I mean, it's like their thing. You know, I, I can't say it's more than the other types of animation. Yeah. I just know from seeing them, you know. I was just going to say, like, there's something to that. Like, there's something about like if you're if you're into stop motion, that means you're not into comfort. You're in you have patience, like you're not into the easy route. All of these things, there's something that attracts you to it. And it's not it's not the easiest thing. So it's like, there's definitely a love that's there and it's not the money and the fame and all that kind of stuff. It's just like, it's, it's in you. It's something that you just have to do. So there is definitely like a traveling circus mentality of like the circus pops up, you work there and then you go on to the next gig. You just keep going to the next spot. That's something that's always been around with stop motion. Well, that's, that's something that's fascinating. Cause I mean, a lot of the stop motion stuff that we see, you know, you know, there's been this explosion of, you know, television shows and, and films again. Um, but a lot of the stop motion that we see a lot of times, you know, Aaron, you can attest this for sure, you know, as always, you know, small <laughs> short films, a lot of commercial work, um, a lot of, you know, fine art or artistic pieces. Um, you know, what was some of that stuff that you were working on, Harv, that then led you to go, how can I make this a full time world? Um, like, what were some of the early stuff that I worked on that yeah. kind of kept? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Christmas holiday specials in stop motion that, that happens every year. You'll see commercials and you'll see there's always specials. It, it's never stopped. Um, so I did this project called A Freezer Burnt Christmas, which was part of the Reference Abandoned uh, Studio. And it aired on NBC and then it kind of just disappeared. But, you know, in 2001, if you were paying attention, it, it was out there <laughs> and kind of disappeared. So that was something I worked on. That took a couple of years. There was a uh, Davy and Goliath Mountain Dew commercial. You guys might remember, you're of my age, but that got a lot of traction. That was spoofing the Davy and Goliath stop motion series from back in the day. That, that was something that was kind of exciting to work on. Other than that, back then, there, there's, there was a lot of kids stuff. There was, you know, what's funny is we did a lot of Lego properties with Duplo and with the, the normal minifigures, but it was before Lego kind of had a voice. So it was like a lot of like direct to store like um, stop motion video. So you, you take their toys and we'd have these stories and they'd be packaged VHS with the, like with the toys. So like they'd be at like, yeah. And they'd play them at like F.A.O. Schwartz and Toys R Us that looped them on the TVs. But it was, it was interesting because it was like Lego didn't have like a creative say in what you're doing. They're just like, here are the toys, tell a story. And then they package it in VHS and then there you go. It's what a difference today, right? Like nowadays, right. Lego is a whole brand and it's right. CG and it's, it's wonderful, right. it's beautiful. But there was a time where they'd let these companies kind of make these little weird videos to sell their products that were really just like safe and just very kid friendly. I did a lot I, of those. And I would say that the, the Michelle Gondry stuff, like with the, the white stripes and all those, yeah. those, 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 those really heightened people's awareness of what could be like done stop motion wise. Yeah. I remember when that came out, I was, yeah. I was like, wow, that is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was, was a big fan yeah, of that. It was very, very cool. Yeah, I'm 
pretty big fan of most of his stuff. Well, yeah, because that yeah. stuff, you, it took a while for, you, for, for everybody. I remember watching it going, that's Legos. Yeah. What, yeah, that was what, really what cool. just happened? <laughs> yeah. So for that, then after you're doing these small stuff, what was the, the impetus then to go, I'm going to do this full time and get into either series or be a studio. What was, what came first? The, you know, the idea yeah. of you directing f films and series, or I'm going to have a studio and be my own freelance boss, so to speak. Yeah. There's a little taste of it when I was in Connecticut and those, the jobs were kind of getting few and far between. I started something up with some of my Brooks friends um, where I went to school and in Paso Robles, we had a little production company where we did, animation and still photography and like wedding videos and things like that so that was my first taste of like this is a small business these are three employees you don't make any money and you just like really hustle for the work um and that didn't work out but i learned a lot about business from that from that little experience um but from that point i met the the cloakies the people who do the gumby stuff because they're right up there in san luis obispo like that area um yeah so then meeting them i kind of saw more about how because they were the cloakies do gumby and they were doing gumby stuff even back then and that's the first time i saw like a studio and like how they're actually making things and it was like wow that's it's not crazy like you have a warehouse and you have equipment and you know like a, it was a neat little peek at how that thing actually things actually work but then after that for seeing that uh, i was able to get a job at robot chicken for season two and that's kind of what really started the career to actually move forward a little bit because Robot Chicken was, at that time, they were in season two. They knew they were getting a season three. So for the first time in my life, like I knew I would have like a year of work, maybe even a year and a half of work. It's like, oh wait, like they're hiring me for season two and season three. Like I can kind of take a deep breath here. Like I have, I'll, you know, I did the show and then you can go to unemployment for a little bit and then you get back into the next season. So that was the first time that I thought, okay, I can kind of make a career of this. But it took me from moving to the East Coast out to LA to like be around more of a community. And that made me feel better too, because it wasn't just like me on an island with a few artists at that smaller company. In LA, there were a couple shows happening and there were a couple commercials. So you kind of felt like if there are enough of us banding together, maybe we can get enough work and we can keep this moving. Interesting. <laughs> There's this one film a lot of people worked on. It's some kind of disaster, uh, kind of robot yeah. chicken -y movie. You know, you know which one I'm talking. I feel like everybody yeah. worked on this film. Well, so I have three little stories for that for you. Okay. Number one, okay. we'll work backwards. Okay. So um, yeah, I worked. I worked on Disaster. Oh, you? So you did? I, I was yeah. wondering if you worked on when you when Bobby asked you. Okay, so there yeah. you go. Okay. Yeah, my wife and I, uh, when we came out here. We worked on disaster for we were at the very end of it so okay. it was i can't remember if it was three months or six months but we, we worked at that um the funny thing about that show is that was in north that was shot in north hollywood and our studio buddy system that me and eric towner started was right next to where that was shot it was like two buildings away where they shot disasters where we started our buddy system studios oh, company. okay so that was kind of interesting um another thing that's interesting is to me at least uh, Mark, Shane, and Chris of Screen oh, Novelties. Yeah, I know those guys really well. They're great. Yeah, they're um, great guys. Great I actually, guys. they used to live in North Hollywood, and then they moved. And their the original studio was in North Hollywood in a garage. And I've they moved been, out of that garage. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the garage I moved into. So when they left, <laughs> yeah, I, I took no over. Kidding. Yeah, my that's wife and I <laughs> took over that house, and then that garage became the very first space of buddy system studios interesting so, yeah so that garage is kind of neat because that's it's not the only, only was... one i never went to the new one that's the only place i've been to of theirs but i've seen them many times over the years but oh interesting so you've you've seen that garage i did i hung oh, out about... there for a day yeah there yeah, there's right. there, so there there's so much about there. there's so much about north hollywood and and indie filmmaking and trying to make a living in la that is a lot of hot swaps like you can take yeah. over my lease and I yeah. think I still have some equipment there. If you... That was exactly it. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was affordable and they're like, hey, you know, someone in stop motion should take this. And at that time, I was just starting to emerge as someone who wanted to do a little bit more than just working on a robot chick. And I wanted to do some things on the side. So that was like, hey, you know, to me and my wife, like you guys should take it. You're doing stop motion. This is a good space for you guys to set up and make a run at it. So then um, my partner and I, Eric Towner, we, like a year later, we bought a Winnebago and then we pulled our Winnebago in the driveway and that became our office and our edit bay. And then the, the garage was cut in half, half was the shop and 
fabrication, the other half was shooting, like for, you know, the shooting animation. Right. Oh, yeah. That's so that's so really funny. wild that you were there. I mean, that's, yeah. there's a lot of stop motion history there. I mean, um, Harry Housen was there. Well, yeah, well, that's the, that. And then I was going to say the Kyoto. So the Kyoto brothers are yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, when I was in school, when I was at Brooks, um, I wanted to do an internship. So I came, so this is like 1999. I drove down to LA and I met those guys and they were very nice. Um, the funny thing was, is I didn't know LA very well. And I came down, they were in Burbank or right near Burbank. Um, I came down to 134 and I, I went to the five downtown during rush hour <laughs> and I got stuck in traffic and I was two and a half hours late for an, for my interview with them. I couldn't believe it. I felt terrible, but they were really nice guys. They were really cool. Um, they're actually the ones that first introduced me to Mark and Shay because they were out in the East Coast working in New York for um, Celebrity, Celebrity Deathmatch. Okay, so that, yeah, and I know quite a few characters who cut their teeth on God, I forgot, I had yeah. forgotten yeah. about Celebrity yeah. Deathmatch. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh, there was yeah. so, you, there's you know so who, much of that. Mm. All right, well, let's talk about puppets because that's important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, the networking and the meeting people and you know, living in a world of <laughs> like-minded individuals is so important for any kind of creative process, uh, especially for stop motion where there's you know not many of you guys. Uh, briefly kind of run us through the skills that you've had to develop, you know, in school and then obviously more outside of school for somebody who's going, Hey, I, I look at something like celebrity Deathmatch, robot chicken crossing swords and go, <coughs> this, this is it. This is my dream. How do I even begin to do this? I'm a very, well, first of all, I'm a shy person. I'm not really outgoing and I, it's not that I don't like people, but I'm not like instantly drawn to conversation. Um, but luckily, and I was absolutely really shy, like in high school, like just wanted to make things, but just couldn't communicate it very well. And that's kind of when I learned, it's like, you know, shoot, like if I want to be a director, like I have to talk, like I have to like be able to communicate my thoughts. This is ridiculous, you know? Um, but when I was in school, I learned a little bit more about like, um, the meeting people and, and the hustle, like together. So like an example is like when I was in film school, it's like, this is like your little crew. Like these are your, this is your gang, right? And the more you can help each other, the more that you can not try to like be better than them. Do you know what I mean? Like, instead of like, I'm the number one guy, like I'm a hot shot from high school and I'm the best Minnesota's ever seen. But if you're just like, hey, like we're in this experience together. And you know what? If we just share the resources and like work towards a goal, I help you, you help me, like everyone's going to win. So I think that's something that happens when you're in art school, you kind of, you gain a little bit of that mentality and that mentality really helps you in the art community because you never stop working together. Like you're always on a team, you know, that's what filmmaking is and, and animation is. Everyone's working together towards the, t the common goal. And that was something that I learned a lot when I was in art school is just, hey, let's let's get together here. It's It's not us against the world, but it's us, you know, like we have to be together, we have to be a team here. So I learned that. And then the other thing too was like, um, no one's going to give you a job just because you're talented and you're nice and you're, you're good looking or whatever. It's like, you have to like really pursue it. So one thing I was kind of good at was just like reaching out to different studios and like, you know, back then there wasn't the email and all that. <laughs> so it's like putting the cold call, like you'd have like the LA 411 or like animation magazine of like who's making animation and I would just cold call people like the Kyoto Brothers was an example. Like I just found out who's making stuff, who's the director and then cold calling. And back then it would work. Like you would be like, oh, I'm looking for Ed Kyoto or whatever. And they'd be like, oh, just a minute, please. It's like, oh my God, that works. <laughs> you know, like you can actually, and these days I don't know if that works, but back then, go ahead. Oh, one thing I was just going to say that, that that I've thought, you know, especially even in this time that we're in now, I think it's even a little amplified is you you might be surprised at some time, sometimes at how accessible some people actually are. Because yeah. I've, I've actually contacted, had people contact me back that I just couldn't believe they were getting back to me. I mean, many, yeah. many times, you know, so yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, Well, that's, and I guess that's my life lesson is it never hurts to ask, right? It never hurts to like try. And I think that's the hustle that it sounds kind of gross, but I think that's just what you have to do as an artist is you have to learn how to sell yourself and you have to learn how to reach out and not be afraid for someone's time. All those, I mean, the worst they'll say is they'll either not answer or they're just too busy and that's okay, but at least you tried. And that was something that I just did a lot is I, I looked at all the stop motion studios. There were like eight, there wasn't that many. And I just cold called all the places and, and pretty much every place I got through and was able to like talk to someone or send my reel to. I mean, I got rejected by everyone. I mean, I tried to get on Deathmatch. I mean, I got rejected there, but at least I was able to talk to someone 
and they gave me feedback too they were like yeah your walk cycles are really rough like do you have any like frame comparison it's like no I didn't have any reference like at that point I was shooting film and I didn't have any reference so it's like yeah it was rocky like what do you expect but I was able to get that feedback so I think that's my point is just like reach out to someone and just you know you don't want to be annoying but you just try and if it doesn't work then you know try later but don't be annoying yeah well, that's that's really great. Hey, you know that that brings me back to something, and maybe it's a little bit technical, but um, when you you know, like when you say you're shooting film, you didn't have your frame reference. I remember that's kind of what I was talking about earlier when like people were shooting sixteen, not really knowing yeah. what they were doing. And I remember, um, well, you know, I've lived in the Bay Area my whole life. I'm in San Francisco, and uh, you know, Nightmare for Christmas was shot yeah. here, and that's yeah. very much a watershed moment in yeah. modern stop motion. You know, that's what yeah. you know, a lot of the people that we work with are from nightmare and I've known tons, but um, there was also a lot of people worked and, you know, Gumby used to be in Sausalito. Cloakie was in Sausalito yeah. originally. Yeah. But anyway, um, a lot of people worked on this uh, television show, very short lived. Bump Saturday in the night. Morning. Bump in the night. I was going to bring it up. And their big thing, I tried to get on that one. And, oh. and when, when I did, uh, it was already dead. It was oh. it had been canceled because when I found out about, but I think their big thing was they had some kind of video tap. They, oh. so they could watch and that was kind of the the birth of the video tap because that's what you had yeah. to get you, you remember at that time yeah um, did you ever did you ever use that at all or was that yeah uh, so did once that changed the game for you yeah i didn't have that when i was in college and college is just shooting on the bullocks no reference never even heard of reference like that's how like technology and information wasn't going around like it does these days but when i got to reckless in connecticut they would have the film camera, the 35 millimeter film camera. Then they'd have a video camera next to it. And then you, they had um, the lunchbox. The lunchbox. That's that right. So the, the lunchbox yeah. would actually yeah. let you have like 255 frames that you could just loop back. And that was attached to a VHS camera. So it's funny because it you wouldn't see exactly what the camera's seeing. It'd be a little bit to the right or left. It'd be off a little bit. But even that was amazing, to, just to be able to toggle and see a little bit of what you're doing. And yeah, and that, that's, was, that was a toggle, right? That wasn't like an yeah. onion skin or something. It was a toggle. Right, yeah, not yeah, like right. what we yeah. can use these days, but it was enough to like really make the animation better. And what's funny, um, when you talk about Nightmare, Nightmare was a big film for me. That was one of the movies that made me think, oh, I, I can do this. I, I drove up to San Francisco in the, like, the late 90s looking for where they shot it. Again, the hustle, like trying to, because I couldn't reach them. And... I remember the, for some reason, I thought they shot in the Presidio. So I drove up there and I found what that was the address. And there was a building that had like boards on it and it said asbestos. And it was all boarded up. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. The Presidio. <laughs> yeah. So a very polite I, go away sign. <laughs> I think I found the building, but I found it like four years later. You, well, you, you said filmmaking and you said stop motion and, and, you know, there's there's a difference between that. How, how do you look at yourself now, Harv? As a, a, are you a writer? Are you uh, a filmmaker? What's your title that you like to live with? I don't know what the title would be. Um, you know, I wanted to be a filmmaker because I thought I wanted to make films. But then I think my sensibilities lend themselves more to TV. Like I'm just a little bit more. Like I don't have the patience for a feature film. Like that's just not necessarily what I want to spend my time doing. So I didn't know it. But I probably learned this on Robot Chicken. I think when I got to Robot Chicken, I learned I liked the speed of TV. I liked the the 10 seconds of day sprint that you're supposed to do as an animator. Like I found that kind of forgiving. The whopping 10 seconds of day, 10 yeah. seconds a day. <laughs> I think as an animator, I, I would get jammed in my head and try to make things too perfect. But when you're doing 10 seconds a day, it's just like, I remember what I would do is it would, I would listen to a song, music. And then after that song, so after like three minutes, it's like, I got to take a frame. Like I need to keep moving. I can't labor it. And that was kind of a real wake up moment for me to be like, I like that. Like, I like knowing this isn't perfect. Like this is as good as it needs to be for this moment. And I'm taking that frame and I'm moving on. And that's how I kind of fell in love with TV because it's, it, it isn't meant to be perfect. Like nothing's really perfect in TV. It's just, you're telling a story, you're telling jokes, you're making it look interesting and funny and you're just moving along. For me, that just kind of like works with my sensibilities and like looking at like crossing swords, it's the same kind of thing. Like the characters aren't perfect. The sets aren't perfect. You know, like it's, it's a fumbly kind of ugly show, but to me, that's relaxing. It's, it's fun. Like, it's just, it's what my brain needs as an artist to not, to, 
to live my life. Is this therapy? This feels really. <laughs> uh, I think it, I, you know to make us all sound really smart. I think it was in the Atlantic or the New York or something like that. Some editorial cartoon. It has two women complaining. It's like, you know, I wish my husband would go to therapy. It's like, no, he just started a podcast. It's much cheaper than. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I want to come back to. I, yeah, I do want to come back to Crossing Swords. I want to devote some time to that. But yeah, you know, we have to do the 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 art school stuff a little bit. Because, I mean, a lot of us who start off on stop motion, everybody goes through it and they're they're ready to pull their eyes out by the end of the first week. Because it's just, yeah. it's such a slog. I've done all this work for nothing. I sneezed. Somebody yeah. came in and bumped, bumped the stage and, and my life is over and I can't believe I've yeah. been doing this. Um, I'm going to go learn to draw now because that seems so much easier than, <laughs> than moving this piece of clay around. Yeah. Um, what... Besides, besides the forgiving aspect of it, you know, I mean, both of you guys can talk about this. What makes stop motion to you such a great medium to work in? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I guess for me, I guess it's, there's something about, and I will say for the record, my first week of animating, like I thought I would love it and I hated it. So I definitely had this expectation my whole life of like, being a stop motion animator and what it's going to be like in the first week on the job, it was like, I don't like this. I mean, big mistake but you know you kind of like you take a deep breath and you learn the quirks of the job and it was awesome and it was great I think whatever I thought it would be it wasn't but that's okay because it was even better than what I was hoping it would be it's just different um but for me when it comes to stop motion it, there's something about like the physical tangible thing that I just that I love like and I also like things that aren't I said before that aren't perfect so it's like it's like a coffee mug that has like a chip in it or that's a little dirty on the outside. We won't say on the inside, you know, there's something to, or like, it's a better example, like a mug that's like been made out of hand, like a clay mug or whatever, like that feels so much better than like a manufactured, like perfect mug. So I think whatever that feeling is again, therapy, whatever that emotion is of like touching, like that practical object, there's something about it that I connect with and that I can relate to. And then when I'm animating and expressing whatever I got to do, that feels like this, it just feels more normal to me than if I was on like on a mouse in front of a computer and just dragging my hand around, clicking and pulling frames. Like, I don't feel that same emotion. Like I don't want to sit and look at a computer screen all day. I'd rather be blinded by like a light and smell like toxic chemicals coming out Acetone. of the puppet. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I want to get my fingers dirty in clay and I want to stand and I want to be uncomfortable and I want to get hot. And, and that's just what I need in my job. So how about you? Well, with me, um, I mean, it is something I've talked about before is that I've, uh, you know, I come from kind of a very blue collar background. You know, I grew up, my dad was in the elevator. He still is. He's an elevator inspector in Missouri and he worked in the union for decades and we grew up you know learning mechanical things i mean and then i and then i ended up you know i worked on houses for a long time and i learned how to do i like i can do plumbing and electrical i know a little bit of all that oh, stuff. That is and, cool. and and but but i'm also i kind of i learned as a drawn animator so i do a lot of 2d animation but to me stop motion <laughs> is the place where i can i'm always looking at materials in that way and how can this be applied to art and i always yeah. have you know because there's been times when i haven't been i've been just been so busy with that kind of work that i was always doing art but it was kind of in the background but i would always identify those things stop motion is very much the medium where those things can be brought in or where you know where you can find ways because there's no real rules to it yeah and, you know kind of piggybacking on what harv said about um the, things aren't perfect and that was that was probably the main thing that i learned from bruce was he very much embraced imperfection. In fact, it was a huge part of his work. That's cool. He saw the thumbprint being visible on the clay as as, yeah. a character, as part of its character, and he loved all those things. He didn't see them as mistakes. And and but that being said, I have never seen anyone do a morph like he could do. Like like even Stephen Kyoto said that to me. He says he's he because he teaches at Cal Arts. You know, he sets yeah. up students with clay. Says do a morph like he did it, and he says no yeah. one can do it. Like yeah, well, yeah, people yeah. can do great work, but not like that. So anyway, so that for me, that's the humongous appeal of it, and the fact that I'm. You know the the computer stuff just doesn't have a humongous appeal to me. I and this is a question I actually kind of wanted to ask because this comes up in some one of the Viz Dev classes that I I teach, and it's it's that um, 
there's a question that's put out there, and sometimes people automat- uh, they push back on it a lot. And it's that because stop motion is something that is physically photographed, that's something that we're actually seeing as a tangible thing, there's an argument to be made that it has a different emotional reaction. Do you think that it might have a different emotional reaction than something that's completely, completely computer generated? My answer is not interesting. I'm kind of curious what other people think. I totally agree. Like I, so here's what's weird about how I feel. And I'm sure you probably, you both agree with this is like when, like for Crossing of Swords season one, like when we're making it, it's really important to me how it's, it's everything. It's like that the crew feels good, that the, the studio is comfortable. Like everything is like, if this experience is good, I really believe it's going to come through in the work. And even though the little characters say really crass things and they, a lot of them are little buttheads, those characters, um, there's a lot of love that's in the show in the characters, but then also in what's being made. And I just, and, until my last breath, I do believe that's true that if you love what you do and if people love what they make, you're making something that just, it's more tangible and alive and it just, it feels better. And again, no disrespect to in the other art forms, the CGs and stuff like that, but I just, I don't connect that way with those things, but I do know when I watch stop motion, I always connect. I can feel like I can feel that artist angst. I can feel their, their bad day. I can feel their good day. I can feel the pain and the love, you know? And so I don't know, but I'm a stop motion person. So I feel that, but I'm kind of curious, but I, I, unfortunately I think most people probably don't like someone sitting in Minnesota watching family guy. I don't think they're thinking about the artist that made it or the paint stroke or whatever, they're just looking for a laugh and they're only, they're here, they're just focusing on that. And that's fine, you know, but I like to think there's people that watch it that are looking for a little bit more, that they're they're feeling for a little something. So I think, you know, the three of us here probably are the same. And I think obviously people, the people that go to art school agree, but I'm kind of curious in the mass world, they probably don't see the same way, which is why we don't see as much stop motion like on TV or even in features, like we're, like what, like 2% or 1% of what's made, so much of it is CG and 2D. It's must be because that's just what people are more gravitate towards or it just feels more comfortable or it's just less weird. Yeah, it's an interesting way of looking at it because I mean, both of you made two, you know, very interesting points. And I think a lot of people, when they go through art school, I, I saw this, like I went to art school and was not doing fine art. I went to art school to be a teacher. I that was what I wanted wanted to teach art. So I just took art school and, you know, just generic everything. And it was the sculpture classes. It was the hands-on classes. It was the get yourself dirty classes. Yeah. You know, the, the very blue collar aspect of stuff. It was far more interesting. Even now, if you, if I drag my wife to a museum or, you know, I play with my kid, it's the here, let's do something tangible. There is that kind of weird craftsman versus artist mentality that yeah, we don't yeah. look at but other people go well is it a is it the guy works on cars but the right. guy who's driving the car is something slightly different yeah um, yeah yeah maybe it's maybe it's the uh the the physicality that that you know some people identify with yeah better i don't know that's yeah that's an interesting yeah interesting way of looking at it because there is some of that stop motion that we do see that is you know, the other end of the spectrum, that, that very fine art or that more, um, you know, heady kind of animation. Like, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's the story, yeah. <laughs> but it's beautiful, uh, right, but right. it is different. It's too much work. It might be too much work for someone who just wants to after work, sit and stare at a TV and relax and just laugh, seeing something that looks a little foreign or a little bit different or a little bit odd. That might be too much of a translation for just zoning out, turning off their brain and just having a laugh, you know? So I don't really know. Like, I don't, I mean, you look at those, those 2D shows and they're, they're way more popular than the stop motion stuff. And it's, is it the writers? Is it, I mean, the writing, is it the, the creation of it? Is it the animation? I don't really know, but it, I, I feel like there's a disconnect with a lot of the viewers, I guess, is what I'm, has to be, right? I, I think one thing too, is that I think that people who create definitely just by their nature kind of look at things in a different way than like the average viewer because i because yeah. i think that they kind of look at things in a way like oh wow i'm really curious how that's made you know i may never yeah. do that yeah but, you yeah. Know, but i even remember going back to nightmare before christmas i think i went and saw the thing like five <laughs> times in the movie theater 
And then I had like some family that went and saw it and hated it. They thought it was stupid and boring. Right. They hated the characters and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was all, do you have any idea what it took to make that? Or they could, and I kind of started to explain it to them and they were, they, they had no idea about that. Like zero. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so like, uh, so I think that some people are looking just, they don't really care what it, what it looks like. They want yeah. that, you know, but I think yeah. to like us, we're like, you know, something like, uh, I actually just saw this. There's a, there's a stop mo movie that just won a big award out there. I think it's called the wolf house. Have you heard of this movie? Mm-mm. Okay. It's, it's, it looks really <laughs> crazy and abstract and like it does everything wrong. And, it, and I, I'm kind of <laughs> cur- I'm kinda curious. I'm really curious about it. There's one called Wolf Walkers that's more of a 2D. That's like nominated for Oscars and stuff. This one's like yeah. a really deep, dark stop mo film. I know a lot of people aren't going to make it 10 minutes into this thing. You know right, what I mean? right. But me, but me and you could probably sit down and just the whole thing be like, oh, whoa, yeah. they use that there. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah. So, you know, so. Hey, just want to take a very quick break and say thank you for listening to Creative Mind. If you have any questions or thoughts, let us know. Click on the show notes for our email or head over to anchor.fm slash creative mind to leave a voice message. But that brings up another question, though, when you're talking about filmmaking, specifically with something like Crossing Swords and, and a lot of the other work that you've done. Do you look at yourself as a writer or because, you know, you're listed as the writer on a lot of things, you know? Yeah. How do you write <laughs> then for stop motion? Especially right. when we're talking series. You know, I guess I would see myself, if I was to put my, a name on myself, I would probably, it wouldn't be writer, I'd probably say director, even though obviously I write on those things. I, I, the reason I say director is that I approach everything from the other angle of visually first. So like with Crossing Swords, like that idea started with wanting to tell a story with peg people in a wooden world with as little limbs and as you know arms and legs as possible like i wanted a real challenge and to dumb it down to something that's just an object what's the simplest way to tell a story so it's working backwards from like a look and like you mentioned it before like a material that's oftentimes how i start too is i start with the material like is this going to be cardboard will this be wood will this be clay is this metal like i i I find the material that or the fabric that i'm excited about and it's kind of like all right and then what's the look going to be and then it's then it's coming up with the characters and story. It's a little bit backwards, <laughs> but that's just how my brain works. Like it starts with the texture and, and it kind of does that. So with that said, I would say probably more of a director because I, I think I'm more of a visual communicator than I am with the written word. But luckily I have, you know, great writers and Tom Root, my my partner in Crossing Swords, he's a fantastic writer. Um, and I let him run with the story and then he lets me run with the visuals and you know it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I was going to ask because I, mean, I, I was re-watching some more of it again before we talked just to re- re- refresh my brain on it. And it was like, how do you pitch a show that has very little animation for a stop motion yeah, yeah. show and yeah. a whole lot of, you know, shit, poop and cock jokes? How, know, how does, yeah, how, does <laughs> how do you just go, all right, I want two impossibles and yeah. write me a check. <laughs> yeah. How does well, that work? We- Right. Well, we started with, and, and the show's evolving, and it's 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 moving in a little bit of a different direction. But the original joke and the original idea of it was cute things, kind of saying and doing naughty things, adult things, um, and that came from my one of my first shows when I was at Reckless in Connecticut was Fisher. It was a Fisher Price Little Person TV show for kids, and as an animator, being in my twenties, like I hated it. Like it just wasn't fun. Like they didn't do anything. They just like. You'd have like six characters walk in a frame. They'd say some things. They'd walk out of frame. Each shot was like 20 seconds long. It was like just boring, you know? So I would just think about what the, what naughty things could these guys do to each other? Or how could they hurt each other? Like that's just what a young person thinks about, right? Um, and so that was kind of the original idea. And then it's taking the idea of an, with Fisher Press Little People, there's all these worlds, right? There's a Western town and there's a space town and all these things. And I like the idea with Crossing Swords that you could have these different play sets and these different worlds that they would visit. Like that's really fun for me. Um, and then at the time Game of Thrones was a big thing. So it's like, oh, like what if we took these really simple cute characters and did Game of Thrones. So that's how we pitched it. It was like little people. It makes sense. I mean, perfect timing. Game of Thrones. And that's the pitch. And yeah, that was the timing. Um, and that was also the time when like Trump was running crazy, like very beginning. And so it was like, we'll have a king who's like 
okay, he's an idiot and he goes crazy. So like that was the idea of the king, someone who's just like selfish and really into himself and all that kind of stuff. That was kind of the pitch was just, it's the two opposites together. Now in TV, at least in animation budgets we work with, you can't really go Game of Thrones with it. Like you can't go as big as the HBO stuff. So the, our cheats would be, first of all, we just couldn't go as big. But the other thing is we would do a lot of like little scale stuff. So like in the opening, you'd, you'd go through and you'd see the whole world and the scale would be like Monopoly size buildings with detail that was like the size, like about Monopoly, meaning like not very detailed. Those little budget adjustments were great because it's kind of sloppy and looks silly, but it's also not necessary to make it like super detailed because that's part of the fun. It's just like, hey, this world is huge. We can do anything, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Let's get to the characters. So it's, it's a real dance because you just can't make like an action stop motion TV show with the budget and the time that you have. You got to kind of just get to the characters and tell the story. But we're, we find the balance where we get, you get the action, but then you also get the story. I, I remember from the webinar you guys did, something was mentioned kind of about storyboards in there. And you guys were kind of like, we kind of have them, but then we kind of go, you know, off from them. I don't know if that's, I remember something like that. And yeah. it's kind of, and my question, I guess, is that um, I'm wondering if this is kind of the, like you, uh, the appeal of, like how you said the things are backwards. Like you start with the material and you go to the character. Yeah. Uh, I think we, I think stop motion people do kind of work a little bit in nonlinear ways. And that's part yeah. of the appeal, you know? Well, it's funny you say that. And then like our production people, the, the grownups who like watch the budget and keep me from spending money, they hate when we go off the storyboards because like in 2D animation, like the storyboard is, that's your world, right? Like if everything is done. So what I like to do, and I try not to do it too much, here's the storyboard. And I spend a lot of time with a great storyboard artist and we figure out the world. But when I walk to the stage and then I have a camera in my hand, I mean... My favorite is still to take that camera and to just kind of like, what else do we got to work with? Well, that's how it's kind of similar to working in live action in a way. It's yeah. like kind of on the border there of that, you know? Yeah. Way. It's more closer the boards, to that. Yeah. And like what we tell network and it's, it's really hard for them. Like the boards, they're loose and like the storyboards we have, they're like really rough and like you, you, the voice acting is great, but you don't have a lot of poses in the, in the animatics to really see what's going on. So it's a real like faith with the network to be like, it's not going to look exactly like this, but trust us is what we say a lot. <laughs> it really is. Because when we get on the stage, we'll see the puppet will be a little bit bigger. The set will be a little bit smaller. And you know what I mean? So, and it's like, oh, if we just went to this here, oh my God, that'd be so much better. But you got to be careful because you can't slow down production. You can't like re redo everything, but you can do a little bit of that. But that is the fun stuff. And also, I remember you said, you guys said you had something like 70 stages going at, at a particular time. Is, that what, is yeah. that what you normally have or is it? Yeah, so we have, it's about 25 to 30 per show. Um, right now we have four shows going, so that it does add up a lot. But yeah, it's, it's 30 stages per show and about 15 to 20 animators per show. Oh, okay. It's a lot to keep track of. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, yeah. You lifted up your laptop last time and showed me like here's a bunch of thumbnails of people doing stuff that I'm directing. Yeah, like because right now on our big board, that's what for Crossing Swords, like it shows every every stage and what's happening on the stages. So there's there's a paper that represents every shot, and every color paper is a different episode. So there's like four or five different episodes right now. Like I said, there's 30 different stages, and each stage we'll do two or three shots a day. So we got to know what's, what's the continuity and all these things. And it's all happening in real time. Like, it's like, it's go. Like you don't sit and like, think about it. You just constantly are just, there's always someone ready for direction, ready for direction. You just, you look at what they've done, where they're headed. And luckily, like at this point, like I know the show, I know the season, I know, I know the scripts. So I understand what's going on. It's, but it's still a lot to like juggle. And, and there's obviously a team of people that are, making all this happen like i'm just there in the moment like do you know what i mean there's a, there's a big crew a lot of artists and from what i recall you guys are also doing the costumes for the masked singer if i'm yeah not, yeah isn't that wild is that one of the yeah that is wild and that is it really the biggest show on tv that's what they say on the commercial uh, you know i don't know so yeah we <laughs> we uh ben bayuth is the one who runs that department and he's great he's been with us for i don't know six years or so and he's just a really talented fabricator of that bigger scale stuff. Now that's the almost the extent of my knowledge of 
the bigger scale stuff because I don't like that's not the yeah. world I, I live yeah, in. Right, right, right. But you know, we see each other in the hallways, and you know, we I, I see the jobs come and go, and they're great. Like he's so talented, and I think I can say we have a show. I can say this: we have a show coming out. It's called Modoc, and it's like a Marvel Modoc. That Modoc is a character, and I think it's coming out end of May on Hulu. Um, and my point is, he made this big, what like life size. Um, version of our puppet and Patton Oswald is the actor that does the voice of that character the Modoc character so it might be on our social media but like it's unbelievable he took the scale this little puppet that we had and he made a big version of it that Patton can walk around in and it's like wow like it's it looks just like the puppet it is so good I mean obviously the Mass Stinger stuff is amazing but to me like that stuff's cool. But I look at this puppet that we made and he made a big version of it. I'm that's like, wow, how'd you do that? Oh, that's that's really cool. Iron, you had a question about like, you know, the, the smart question, the, the intellectual property question. You know, oh, how, right. how do you deal with intellectual property in something like Robot Chicken and, 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 and right, right. Pop, pop culture themed? Yeah. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about kit bashing and, you know, like, you know, oh, making yeah. up. And, and I was telling him how I went to a Star Wars exhibit in Tokyo and I was looking at one of the, I think I was looking at Slave One, the, you know, the Boba Fett ship. And I, from what I remember, the description on it said that part of it was from a Porsche model originally, like from a model of a Porsche. And I was kind of wondering how that translates intellectual property wise when someone might identify it as something that they did. You know what I mean? Or. A few thoughts, you know, like if you, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but what I'm yeah. always told is if you change something like 20%, right, then that's, that's a thing. If you change something enough, and then I think it's just, if you go out of the way to not make it look like it. So like an example is um, with that, or like, well, I'll take Robot Chicken as, as an example. Like if we take an action figure, well, that's parodies, that's different. But I guess my point is if you took, if you kit bash an action figure, and he took like the head of He-Man and like the arms of Batman and the legs of like something else. And you put it together and it looks different and it's clearly not the original thing. Then legally you're okay because it's it's not that, right? So it's like kit bashing is, is a big part of what we do in stop motion and in Robot Chicken is taking existing things and changing them and making something new. Like that's what we have to do like for a lot of our sets and puppets because you can't make every little thing from scratch. I mean, Crossing Swords you do, because that's a wood world, but like with Robot Chicken and Super Mansion, there are other shows, like you, you're constantly kit bashing things to make it. And that's that's like a whole art form in itself and a whole community of just like really knowledgeable nerds, like making really cool stuff. Yeah, we're big fans of that. I, I, real quickly, I do have one student question for you, and it's kind of related to the last thing we were talking about. It's from my student, Emily. She's in my stop motion two class. And it was that um, she remembers from your webinar that you guys were maybe going to have a studio opening in Toronto. Is this correct? Or is yeah. it already open or is that? It, it is open. Yeah, we are. We opened something in Toronto. We're So what's crazy is things are so, I love Burbank. I live and die in Burbank, but we are busy and we are booked. Like we're just like so full up. There's just, there's no, like we're almost out of artists down here. So we had to like, look, where else are there artists? So the funny thing is, is that, I mean, a lot of people go to Portland, but that area seems pretty tapped. But there was a company called Cup of Coffee that used to be in Toronto that had a big studio and they did a lot of, a lot of kids stuff back in the day. They actually did some Fisher Price Little People. That is just an FYI. But my point is there's a good community of artists up there that are looking for work. So that that's why we chose Toronto is that there's just, there is like a community of of artists that don't have work and it, it made sense for us to like where's the where are the animators and that's where we we chose so we have a show up there um it's called ultra city smiths and it's starting it's shooting now so it's it's something that we're you know we're we're doing that too and it's again like we'll we'll try to find projects to happen up there because there's a lot of really good crew up there um our home base is always going to be burbank but there's a lot happening up there. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And uh, she said, reach out to them. Well, that, that was going to, you know, to kind of wrap it up. Cause I mean, you know, we can sit there and, and nerd out for forever and, you know, maybe we will someday, but as somebody who's now running a stop motion studio as the big boss, big cheese, yeah. the giant, the giant wedge. Oh, cheese. Somebody that's going to school, 
big into stop motion, you know, give us some things that, you know, they should be looking out for. And, and besides, you know, not being a jerk, what, what are you looking for when it comes to somebody that you want to bring into the studio? Yeah. Well, I guess my thoughts are, you know, number one, and I'll say these days, sound like an old man, but like putting stuff on social media, I think is really good. Like, I think whatever your artwork is, whether it's animation or if it's fabrication or sets or whatever, I think getting your art, establishing it on social media and just like posting it out there, I think is a good thing. You're expressing yourself, you're showing the world. That's a good thing. Um, and while you're out there on the social media, it just like when you're in art school, I think it's networking. It's finding the like-minded people that are doing what you're doing, liking their stuff, paying attention to their stuff, having a conversation with them and what they do because their art is just like you. It's the same kind of thing. It's like, hey, we're a gang. What are you doing? Cool, this is what I'm doing. Sharing tips, you know, sharing resources and you're sharing knowledge. And then I'd also say like, this goes back to what we were saying earlier is not being afraid to reach out to people either that you admire, that you think are do really cool stuff or places that might be hiring. Um, those are great things to do. And especially if it's like an artist that you really like what they do, like reach out, say, hey, nice work. Who knows that person in a couple of years the, they might get the promotion and they might be looking, they might be in the position where they can hire. So I think it's just like, in my opinion, it's just communicating with people as much as you can generally. Like, I don't think it's, it's not like fake, like, oh, hey, nice work. But really like, if you, if you really like what you do, you're going to like what they do too. express it and reach out and don't be afraid, you know, even with the companies, you know, like, like our company or other stop motion companies, it's like, you can reach out to whoever's running the social media and you can say hi, you can make a connection. It's the same thing like we would do back in the day when you'd call like a reception. It's like the reception person is, it's a human being, right? Like that's their job. You say hi, you you know, you you get to know them a little bit. And then maybe it's like, hey, is there that director? Like, do you think, is there any way I can like reach him? Same thing with social media. It's like, hey, social media person, like, is there any way I can give like, just say to that director, like nice work or do you have any advice? Because the other thing too in the artist community is I think a lot of people are always happy to give advice because everyone was in that position. Everyone started out. Everyone was like trying to get that next job. So we're all very eager to help. I think it's just don't be afraid to ask, you know? I think those are my one, two, and threes. That That's pretty good because that's, that's one of the things I think a lot of people forget is, you know, everybody's an artist and everybody yeah. wants to help each other, which seems you know, counterproductive to a lot of the stuff we yeah. do sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, we're lucky because definitely in the art community, you know, we're all artists and we all want to help. And when, I don't want to say we're all nice people, but in the, for the most part, we're nice people and we all, we, we, we get it, you know what I mean? So it's like, we're relatable. So I think um, this isn't like, I don't know, perfect, like maybe an agent, like maybe agents is a little bit scary. I don't know, no, no disrespect to agents, but that might be a little more cutthroat. And animation might seem cutthroat because a lot of people are going for the same jobs, but then you'll realize like in short term, you might be going for that same job as your friend, but in the bigger picture in your career, you guys will be coming and going all the time, you know? So it's like you're looking at your peers less as competition and more as like, not assets, that sounds kind of gross, but just as like a game, right? Like as people that are experiencing this, this art form and, and moving it along. Yeah, I guess. That made any sense. That sounded really good. That, that sounded good. Yeah. Therapy. Yeah, that was good. That was good. <laughs> and don't leave art school because it's safe in art school. Yeah, and I always, I always tell people, you know, it's really important to be cool and a good person because. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times when that'll get you farther than the guy who's the hot shot who's not very cool. Yeah. You know. Well, actually, so. that's a really good point, and I want to say something that we we always have a policy where it's like, don't you know, like no assholes. But I think it's a really good reminder. Every person that goes into art school thinks or was the best in their class in high school. They were like a hot shot in the small town in high school, and now they're in the art school, and that's a really big deal. And they're great and good for them. But you got to like kind of check the ego a little bit because the ego might get you in that door, but the ego is not going to keep getting you work. So I think it's like, hey, you're great. And an artist needs to be told they're great because they are great. But they also need to be like deep breath be nice, like be a human, you know, like be kind, because that's going to get you the job. If you're interviewing and you're just cool and kind, and the other person is just like egotistical and, and like, yeah, I can do, of course I can do this. I can do this in my sleep. It's a little bit like, uh, let me go for the guy who's a little more humble and just like kind of nicer than the one that's like eager to take my job or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean no I, I i can definitely remember times i've lost jobs because of that <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly 
we've all been there it's, like, right. it's also like when you're in school it's like you need to have that edge you, you really need to like be showing and proving yourself and when you come out of school you want to show everyone you can do it right because now like you did college and now there's like a career and like i'm as good as you like i'm younger but i'm just as good as you so it's like how do you show that without just like coming across as being like you know egotistical or just aggressive i think it's just you got it you got yourself here just be nice be humble and let your work speak for itself you know wow yeah tough good good session guys good you know we'll take some good, notes we'll, uh, good we'll see how it goes we'll see yeah, how it goes next yeah, time yeah. <laughs> i hope you get that job i'll put a good word in for you <laughs> So there you have it, just a little bit of extremely valuable information in the world of stop motion and creativity. Because if you've ever dreamed about a career in art and design, understand that employers are always on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. And at the Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco or anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request info about our 40 plus areas of study in art and design, including game development, animation, UX design, and more, visit our website at academyart.edu slash creative mind. I'm Bobby Brill. Thanks for listening.